Okay, we don't want to, we can't hear you. Oh, uh, please turn on your microphone. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we can't hear you. Uh, maybe I should. All right, sure. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, well, hopefully this will be the last technical glitch. All right. Well. No problem. All right. Give me my volume. So here, well, oh, thanks for the kind introduction. This is the very first time that I'm giving a talk to a group of entirely the physical chemists. So I'm scared to death and hopefully I will survive it. So today I'm going to talk about a very small story. And in fact, it is a beautiful collaboration as, as far as, as I can say with Professor Choi, who is actually organizing this conference. And probably this is the reason that why I was invited. So chemistry of benzene, right? As a chemist, we are all familiar with this very small six-membered ring compound. So initially I was thinking about giving a two separate talks. So one is about the benzene as a functional component that absorbs and emit light. Quite recently, we published a paper together with Professor Choi, what he claimed, well, is in fact, is the true, the smallest red emitting molecule. So the structure is very simple. It's deceptively simple but the chemistry is really amazingly interesting. So the second topic I was thinking was using benzene not as a chromophore, but as a scaffold to really support uh, different functionalities. So in, in one paper we recently published, we made the molecule that present three chromophores to one direction and three long tails to a different direction. They self assembled in water in the presence of these anions to show pretty interesting chemistry. But I decided to really focus on just only one story today, and hopefully it will make some sense. So how it all started? Well, this is bioinorganic chemistry 101, and you may wonder, so why the hell do we really have to know about this inorganic chemistry? So in fact, by training, I am a synthetic inorganic chemist. So one of these textbook examples of this chemistry, in fact, is Professor Scheich has been really a, one of the major players in this game was, really understanding the chemistry occurring while the proton is somehow participating in a delicate array of this electron transfer pathway. So if you look at this peroxidase active site, here's a pretty interesting array of the hydrogen bonding in such a way that it's a carboxylate which polarized the NH bond of the imidazole. So the consequence is you generate this cascade of this formal electron push to render charged this charged character, this imidazole, which behaves like imidazole late. So that now this is really giving a big push. And then there's a big pull coming from this protonated hydroxy group, proton coming from the imidazole. So this is a beautiful example of the push-pull effect to really uh, work in concert to heterolyze chemical bond. So now, change your, changing your perspective, literally changing your perspective, just turn it 90 degree here, you look at this funny looking geometry, but if you look at this, you can see the difference. Well, nature utilized almost the same array, but in this case, without using metal. So this is the textbook example of setting protease, which is a beautiful example of a cascade hydrogen bond. In each, again, the charge is really pushing to one direction to help deprotonate this nucleophilic setting residue to attack this carbonate groups. So here, they utilized almost the same kind of strategies. This is now polarizing this chemical bond in one direction, push-pull effect. For some time, you are wondering if there's a way to really mimic this process using small molecules. So coming back to the setting protease structure, we thought, well, probably we can construct this small molecule having this benzimidazole, having a very elaborate looking hydrogen bonding network. The whole purpose of this molecule was promoting the nucleophilic electrophilicity of this carbonyl group by making the hydrogen bond so that this is really hungry for electron. Then may come from the cyanide anion. So in the resting state or in unbound form, this carbonyl group functions as a quencher site so that this fluorophore is non-emissive. But once you attack the cyanide, 
you make the cyanohydrin adduct, now it turns on. So we try to really borrow a page from the biology, how to really organize this pyrogen bond in the vicinity of this pi conjugate scaffold to do some interesting chemistry. Recently, we really expand this concept to generate this donor acceptor functionalized benzimidazole. So if you look at very carefully, this is amphiprotic imidazole, right? Imidazole is, can function both as proton donor and acceptor. So we intentionally put donor and acceptor in the context of hydrogen bond so that we can build an intricate array of these hydrogen bonds and systematically convert this bidentate NN site by functionalizing with this diphoroboreal. So it looks like a bodipi-like fluorophore, but systematically decreasing the number of hydrogen bond, so it becomes less sensitive, but at the same time, it becomes more rigid, so that it increases fluorescent quantum yield. So now, where are we going with this? Well, what's going on here? All right, what is this? funny looking line here. Anyway, so here's the, I don't know what's going on here. Well, if it doesn't bother you too much, I'll just keep going. So here's the cascade hydrogen bond going for the one direction. So now, now it's really getting really annoying. I don't know. Can I briefly stop sharing and come back? I don't know what is going on. Today is very strange day. I, I don't know. Mm. All right. Take right. Time. Yeah, yeah. Now it's gone. Right. Okay. Maybe yeah. I'm just talking too much. So I should <laughs> really move move the slide quickly. So from synthetic point of view, you build this benzimidazole by simply condensing and oxidizing this diaminobenzene with aldehyde. This is the sophomore organic chemistry. So about two years ago, we were making this molecule hoping that we will install a different hydrogen bonding donor and acceptors on the both side. So they're making the T-shaped structures. So that was our initial plan. Well, didn't work. My student got you know, almost spot to spot chemical transformation, but the NMR spectrum was very simple. It, it couldn't be this molecule we were after. So I asked my students, so what was it? We had no idea what was going on. Well, we fished out crystal and we got the X-ray structure. And now it made sense why the NMR spectrum was so symmetric and simple because this is diacetyl phenylene diamine. So this is just simple looking benzene molecule, acetyl group, amino group. If you look at this molecule, you may say, well, probably I saw that in my sophomore organic chemistry textbook. But is it really true? Is it really true? Wow. <laughs> now, if you look at your organic chemistry textbook, we really couldn't find the molecule because nobody made it. Well, you, you have to trust me. So although there are many that just like, there are more than enough benzene derivatives, but there was not a single example of having these two acetyl group and two amino group positioned in this way. So out of curiosity, we looked for the other isomers. Well, they were also all unknown. So this is simple hydration, desidylation chemistry of this tips protected acetylene. So obviously this is the one of the most stupid way of making this simple molecule. But if you really don't think about it, it's not such an obvious way to really make this molecule. So what was it? Well, my students said, well, professor, this is very interesting because the molecule is fluorescent. I said, no, it cannot. It cannot be because this is a simple benzene molecule. It has even this amino group that just typically usually quenches fluorescence by PET. You also have the acetyl group, LCA rule, but other carbonyl compounds are also quenchers. Well, but we found that depending on where you put amine and acetyl group, Certain molecules are green, certain molecules is red. A wrong isomer is non-emissive. So, wow, what is really going on? So if you think about making the benzene as a starting point and build a fluorophore, well, you start from something very small, 
but the homo lumo gap of the benzene is prohibitively large. It absorbs in UV region. It emits in, in this UV region. So that's why it's colorless. You can put electron donor and acceptor systematically to narrow this homo lumo gap. So now by having one set of amino acid, second set of amino acid, you can systematically narrow the gap. Well, in fact, for now about 10 years, in recent 10 years, the community, synthetic community has been really be curious about the possibility of making a really small fluorophores. So first, why? Well, small molecules tend to penetrate into cells without disrupting this physiology of the cell too much. So if you want to image something, you don't want to perturb the system you want to monitor too much. So this small molecule is beneficial. At the same time, small molecule, when they crystallize, do not pack face to face tightly. In other words, there are might be some heading bone structures, but still, unlike the extended polycyclic compound, they suffer less from pi pi stacking and interchromophore coupling. But if you really want to make some benzene as a good 404, you want to have this molecule emit a, a spectral range that's useful. So the, the challenge was, can you really start from a benzene, the real small particle in a box, but realizing long wavelength emission? The seemingly impossible challenge was really tackled by synthetic chemist. And if you really look at the image, Katagiri, Yuan, Zhang, Mandel. The structural features, you can see that, wow, there are donor groups and there are acceptor groups. So maybe there might be certain magic about having donor acceptor. And then these molecules show a large stock shift so that they emit a long wavelength. So now, how do you explain this large stock shift? Well, you have donor and acceptor. So a lot of people say, well, this is probably coming from intramolecular charge transfer. And some people point the word homo lumo asymmetry. But give me a break. Homo and lumo, they cannot be symmetric, right? If you look at, think of, so this is pretty funny way of saying something that even they don't know. Well, push pull. So now, charge transfer type excited state can certainly emit a long wavelength. But starting from the benzene, you put donor and acceptor. Do you really believe that there is a significant charge separation? Donor acceptor type interaction requires there's a predominantly donor part and predominantly acceptor part. So the upon excitation, there's an intramolecular electron transfer type process. So you polarize this molecule having electron rich and pull part so that in polar environment, they can be stabilized, et cetera, et cetera, so that you meet much, at much long wavelength. But from six member during benzene, for us, this seems to be pretty unlikely. But people just propose things that without really knowing what's really happening. So if you look at this UV visible and emission spectra, they are almost like mirror images, indicating that there's no significant structural change or charge distribution. So it seems to be some kind of the local emission, if you look at this feature. But why such a huge stock shift? And also the second question is, ortho and para isomers are emissive, but meta isomer is not. So why is the case? So I have no idea. I can make this hand-waving argument until my arm falls off. I can scratch my head until I bleed, but I cannot get the answer. So I asked Professor Choi about, well, is there a way to really figure this out? So he gave me a hand. So his group with Michael Filatov and Udin Park, they embarked on extensive study using the theory that I know nothing about. So, so this is a multi-reference spin flip time dependent DFT calculation. So first we look at this ortho isomer. So upon excitation from, from condon state, you rapidly slide down to this excited state minimum geometry. But going up to this connector intersection is an uphill process. As a result, 
the molecule stays in this local minimum here and it emits light. Those quantum intersection involves being puckering or proton transfer, but neither of these happens. Aha, uh -huh. maybe this is the reason. There's no large structural change. There's no proton transfer. So this is the reason that why it behaves like a local emission, although we have still no clue about is why it has such a huge stock shift. Para-isomer, very similarly behaving, although this potential energy surface is slightly different, it can eventually, if it has energy, it can go to this proton transfer state, but it never reaches there. It sits on this local minimum and it emits because these are uphill processes. So a lot of things that people claimed without evidence, well, there might be some proton transfer. As a result, there's a huge spectral shift. At least this molecule doesn't follow the paradigm. What about this meta, which is dark? Instead of going to S1 excited state, it goes to S2. And then there's a rapid in <clears throat> internal conversion. There's a crossover point between S1 and S2. So now it really falls down to the S1 state. It goes through this downhill to arrive at this first proton transfer path, but it doesn't. Second, it survives. While staying here, eventually, however, it goes to this molecular intersection, which is the consequence of this double proton transfer. Aha. Uh -huh. Translated into chemical language, although these three isomers have identical chemical composition, for this meta isomer, your NH group is sitting para to acetyl group. So if you recall your sophomore organic chemistry, acetyl is electron withdrawing group. So it polarized this NH bond significantly. So it's much more acidic. So if this proton can move, it just non relatively decays. So at least we understood why certain isomers is non emissive. So now, can you do some chemistry with this? The beauty about this chemistry is this is a simple molecule, deceptively simple, two amino group, two acetyl. For the acetyl group, you cannot do much, but for the amino group, you can functionalize. So we systematically put substituents on the nitrogen group. We can put on both sides. You can put only the one side. The consequence is you put electron withdrawing groups to this amino group, you attenuate, its donor ability, as a consequence, you lower this homo, but without changing too much of a lumo. So you systematically induce or elicit a blue shift as you attenuate the donor ability of this nitrogen donor. So here's the game plan. You have a stock shift. We don't know why yet, but at least we can excite the molecule at different wavelengths by changing the donor ability. So we can cover almost the entire visible spectrum. We looked at this absorption and emission and find that uh, there's a good correlation between this Hamid parameter. So certainly there's a ground state electronic property playing a role here. Regardless of the substituents, your stock shift is magically almost identical. So that's bizarre. These molecules are all different. They absorb at different wavelengths, but the amount they shift between absorption and emission is constant. It's almost like having a ruler and moving. So apparently, it is not about this peripheral functional group that's giving rise to stoke shift. That was the hint. There might be something more fundamental, and that was the core. A bonus is also you put additional substitutions on this nitrogen so that your NH group is much better polarized, make a better hydrogen bonding contact so that the molecule becomes more rigid. So as you increase the hydrogen bond, the molecule becomes more emissive, as you can see from this fluorescence quantum yield. When it comes to frontier orbitals, these are all very similar. So these are homologous set of the molecules. Electronic wise, they are essentially superimposable. The difference is that like difference in energies. So now here comes the most critical question. So we can explain the structure dependent change in absorption energy. 
but why such a huge stock shift? So we calculated this mixed values. So that from the ground state, Frank Condon, and S1 minimum, and then a vertical DX station. If we just pick four point and really draw this grid map, we can certainly see that in the ground state, you have it's benzene, so it's aromatic. But upon X station, this is anti-aromatic. Now, from Frank Condon to S1 minimum, you have significant relief of anti-aromaticity. So, so what's the meaning? Upon X station, the benzene becomes anti-aromatic, which is very un unstable. It tries to be stabilized. So while staying in the excited states, it relaxes to S1 minimum having significantly attenuated anti-aromaticity. And from there, it vertically drops. What was beneficial for the excited states now backfiring. So from ground state point of view, your aromaticity is now attenuated. So you have very unhappy ground state. So you have the excitation and here's relaxation, drop unstable ground state. So that's creating an energy difference between excitation and emission. So from hindsight, it was pretty well-known phenomenon. This is the Baird rule. Four and plus two rule system, the Huckel system upon excitation becomes anti-aromatic. So now, what is the role played by the hydrogen bond? If you look at this geometries of this excited state, this molecule is becoming this quinoid structure, anti-aromatic. And now upon relaxation, you are strengthening this hydrogen bond. From Frank Condon to S1 minimum, there's a significant alternation of this CC bond. Your hydrogen bond is now helping a jiggling of this pi skeleton. So now let's talk about some chemical language. Well, I don't claim that I understand this. I just stole from a reference. But this is the way you explain this excited anti-aromaticity. This picture is more familiar to me. So if you think about this excited state benzene having either biradical or cbtionic character, you can draw different resonance structures to describe excited state benzene. If you look at these type of structures, your hydrogen bond is now significantly helping this quinoid type bond alternated structure. So excited state anti-aromaticity is now relieved by the help of the hydrogen bond. You can now take a snapshot of the individual data points relaxing from Frank Condon to S1 minimum. You can see that there's a gradual decrease in the mixed value consistent with the fact that the molecule is becoming less anti-aromatic. And this behavior is observed across the entire set of the molecule we monitored. So it is not just one oddity. Next values, control map, very consistent. Now let's come back to this argument. Prior to us, there are many beautiful examples of this single benzene four force. It's a beautiful phenomenon, but did they really understand what's going on? Well, it is not intramolecular charge transfer. It is not homolomo asymmetry. It is not push-pull. We even revisited the classical examples of these two prior works. One was from Katagiri, the other is from the Zhang. Our excited state anti-aromatic relief model works beautifully well with both systems. So it is about the core, not the periphery. The periphery is helping to really push absorption energy to the visible. But why this large stock shift? This is a skeletal rearrangement of the benzene. So previously, well, it's quite interesting that these findings are really coming in, in quite recent, a few years. Excited state antiromatics can be relieved by either proton transfer. This is a nuclear movement by definition or proton coupled electron transfer. 
we show that hydrogen bond without actually moving proton can really relieve excited state atomicity. So think about the particle in a box analogy from someone like me, not a physical chemist. So think about this analogy. So benzene, ground state aromatic, excited state anti-aromatic, there's a significant nuclear rearrangement. So there's a huge stock shift. If you fuse more rings to the benzene core, you are expanding the size of the box. So there will be a spectral shift. At the same time, the nuclear movement before and after the excitation won't be as significant as the benzene. In other words, if you want to shake something, shake something small, because whatever change will be dramatic. If you shake something big, even though individual things might move, but on average, larger size won't really have a net geometric change as significant as the benzene. So that's my claim. So the best single nitrogen 404, having this very small core, you have a chance of inducing large stock shift to minimize spectral overlap between excitation and emission. But the challenge is you have to absorb and emit at the energy window that's feasible or useful. So our system, if you just simply calculate the molecular weight, this is the lightest red emitting molecule ever known. How do you know? I asked my student to really compile almost 60 different compounds. We really went through everything to find that size-wise, this top molecule is gigantic. Our molecule is tiny, tiny. But when it comes to excitation and emission, these are very comparable. So you really do not really have to have a large box to emit at longer wavelength. So that was our take-home message. But now, is it done? Well, I have five minutes, so probably I'll share one more story with you. So now the picture is now becoming more clear to us. There are at least three different ways to relieve excited state heteromaticity, proton transfer, PCET, and hydrogen bond. But what about proton transfer and hydrogen bond? If you think about it, proton transfer is the extreme form of hydrogen bond, right? Donor, acceptor, trying to compete to really grab this proton. If something that is holding onto one part, but not really being transferred, you make hydrogen bond. But if that bond is broken, it moves. In our study, we found that if you put really electron withdrawing, trichloroacetyl group, your NH bond becomes sufficiently acidic. So you begin to see two different emissions. In fact, this is coming from the fact that there is a dual process. One is coming from what you call as the normal form in which it doesn't lose proton. The other is the totomer form in which during its lifetime, your proton is being transferred from nitrogen to the oxygen. So what's the point? Dual emission, if you want to really realize the white emission, one trick is mixing two different colors. But other times people just mix two different flow for, but you really have to mix the, with this perfect ratio. And if your polarity changes, the color changes. So there are many things you have to really consider. If one molecule can emit both blue and orange light, you have a higher chance of reproducing and really having a good control over the white color. But the challenge is a lot of times you rely on charge transfer. So in that case, your polarity is really moving things left and right. In our case, the normal form is almost local emission because it is not charge transfer. The second part is excited state proton transfer. How do you know? We calculated this normal form and this total form to find that, yes, indeed, there's a balancing act. So there's a rapid equilibrium between two different emissive forms. Again, hydrogen bond is playing an important role here. Now, we can really make this a series of molecules. The trick is you have to control the excited acidity of the NH group 
so that the right amount can be transferred. Because if everything's transferred, you don't see the normal emission. So there are two ways you can control this. You have to control this total equilibrium. You now have to lower this one energy level to create the blue light. Now we can play this game using this synthesis. So here's the one of these unpublished work that we are working on. This is the, the very first example of single benzene based white emitter taking advantage of these dual emission pathways. So extended pi conjugation is useful. That's great things, but you do not necessarily need this just to realize long wavelength emission because benzene can take care of this. So small is beautiful. And because this was such a simple system, very small, very rigid, so that we were able to really, you know, get help from the professor choice group to really map out the details of this fate of excited state. Money came from National Research Foundation and then Samsung. And I really thank my collaborator. And this work was done by Hichan, almost single-handedly did it. Young is working on dual emission pathways.